I see we have some new people. Were you here yesterday? No. And were you? No. Come in. Come in. So Good morning. So this looks like we have uh, several people from the Edenton Re Racial Reconciliation Group that has been operating for a number of years uh, in the community. Uh, and it started out of the, uh, the uh, Edenton uh, Methodist Church. Uh, today we are going to have more about locals, and, and we are defining local as also being Bertie County, um, give some presentations. And I do want to remind you that I always feel that a lot of times when we say things in Juwan and Edenton, we should include Bertie County because of the fact that Bertie County was part of Juwan up until 1722. And much of the things that we said over in Bertie County now were back before 1722. And sometimes people forget that most of our fearless leaders lived in big palatial plantation houses, and some weren't quite plantation houses, right across the river. And so when they started developing over here on this side later, a lot of the leaders of Chuan County were buried over there, so they moved them over here to the church. So I thought I would give you that history so that you can know that in order, and we're talking about preservation and so forth also, but I thought I would tell you that sometimes you have to move the deceased to preserve them too. <laughs> he actually brings up a good point. The, one, some of the governors I'll be speaking about are ones that were, like Charles Eden, relocated from the plantations across the river back over to here. Um, and buried in right. Right. Eden House, all of that is over there. Okay, I won't get into your... I have a tendency to sometimes talk too much, so I will <laughs> turn it over to uh, Charles Boyette, who is with the State Historic Sites, and he got his undergraduate work at East Carolina and, and did a little graduate work but never quite finished my MA. But I've been my name is uh, Charles Boyette. I work for Historic Eden State Historic Site. Uh -huh. uh, we're at 108 North Broad Street and uh, we do tours of some of the historic buildings like the lighthouse and the courthouse and things like that. We're always looking for volunteers. If anyone's got any free time, please come by. We can always find something for people to do. Um, I will be speaking on the Lord's Proprietors and a few of the early... Yes? Could you move your podium to your right okay. from in front of the screen if you're going to be using the... Yeah. Uh, what was it? Uh, yeah. I um, will be speaking on the Lord's Proprietors and the early governors, of uh, some of whom are highlighted in this region. Um, to begin with... Uh, I want to start with uh, thank you for uh, the appreciation to the library and the historic commission and everyone, uh, Mrs. Uh, e. Hayes, for inviting me. This is quite an honor. I see a lot of uh, some people that have uh, met before recently and some people that have known me since I was a kid. <laughs> um, so it's like coming home. Um, to start with, as Americans, we live in a modern democratic society with no hereditary titles of nobility being granted or used by our leaders. Yeah, did you know that here in North Carolina, at the very early settling of the colony that was to become our state, we had a relatively complex system of government based on hereditary nobility and the ownership of land. This system and its leaders were known as the Lord's Protector, Proprietors. This occurred during the late 1600s after the end of the English Civil War and the return of the monarchy and the ascension to the throne of King Charles II of the House of Stuart following the death of Oliver Cromwell as Lord Protector. As a bit of background reminder, if you remember the English Civil War occurred during <coughs> the late 1600s. The wars centered around um, who would control the finances of the kingdom, whether the king or parliament. Ultimately, King Charles I uh, lost his throne and the war, and unfortunately his head, quite literally, um, and was captured and beheaded. His family, uh, including his heir, Charles, who was to become Charles II, uh, went into exile in France and in later other parts of Europe. Oliver Cromwell ruled for something like eight years um, during the protectorship as Lord Protector. 
He had been the general in charge of the parliamentary forces before he passed away. Eventually, after his passing, there was a power vacuum, and there was decisions about who to, uh, what kind of government to have, and it was decided to reinstate the monarchy. When King Charles II assumed the throne, like many political leaders, he owed debts and favors to those who had helped him. He would, came out of exile and was able to take back his father's throne, but not without help from various important political factions and leaders in uh, England. The House of Stuart was not known for holding on to money very long, so there was not much in the royal treasury that he could pay these debts with. What he did have in abundance, though, was a territorial claim to much of the east coast of America. There were issues with this claim, however. To begin with, the land was already settled and occupied by a large number of Native American peoples whose home it was and naturally did not appreciate European settlers plundering their lands and the theft of their ancestral lands and properties. Also, other European countries claimed lands in the same areas as well. However, by signing over these claim, his claim to these lands, the king was able to literally clear his debts and favors with the stroke of a pen. As well, he could extend England's territorial power, create colonies that could be, become important trading partners, and strengthen the English claims to America. The Lord's proprietors themselves consisted of some of the most powerful and well-connected noblemen in England. And you'll recognize a few, those of you who passed through this area might recognize a few uh, place names connected with these gentlemen. They included George Monk, the Duke of Albemarle, the Albemarle region, of course, William Craven, of course, Craven County, the Earl of Craven, John Berkeley, Baron Berkeley, Anthony Ashley Cooper, Ashley and Cooper Rivers down in South Carolina. He was a Baron Ashley, so George Carteret, of course, Carteret County, so William Berkeley, Sir Peter Carleton, Edward Hyde, the Earl of Clarendon, and as I said, anyone familiar, if you drive along the roads and highways and byways of this region, you'll recognize a lot of these names. Um, just like the, uh, today when a famous politician, particularly if they passed away recently, it's often as common to name a bridge or a highway or something like them. One of the figures that has a very much a local connection that I would like to highlight is George Monk, the Duke of Albemarle. As you can imagine, this is, the, of course, the origin of Albemarle Sound and the general name for our, the region in which most of us live. His portrait in the robes of a knight of the garter and can be seen hanging in the ballroom of the Chauhan Courthouse. Um, when the colonies were being mapped and settled, it was common to name for to give uh, famous people's names to places, and that was also a way of encouraging patronage for the colony and things like that. It was thought that if a wealthy, powerful nobleman had something named after him, he would be more likely to help support it. George Monk himself was one of the central figures in English politics of that period. He was born into an English gentry family that had an ancient impressive lineage, but not much money. He became a professional soldier by trade and rose to the ranks to become a general under Lord Protector of Oliver Cromwell during the English Civil Wars. This meant that he served on the parliamentary side during the English Civil War. During the time of the power vacuum left when Oliver Cromwell died, George Monk was in a very unusual position. He was at the time in charge of a large army that had been sent to Scotland that was in the middle of rebellion against the protectorship. Large sums of money had already been spent um, to both pay and equip the army. And this meant that uh, when Cromwell died during the power vacuum, he was essentially the person in charge of the largest, best paid armed force in the kingdom. It was his, uh, when the decision was made among the power brokers of England to uh, decide what kind of government to have, whether a republic, a monarchy, um, elect another Lord Protector, it was his deciding vote in favor of the monarchy and the reinstatement of the House of Stuart and the person of King Charles II that brought uh, the king back to his throne. As a reward, he was made the Duke of Albemarle and was rewarded with estates that included a share of the East Coast as Lord Proprietor. Now, some of you may wonder where the name Albemarle comes from. Believe it or not, um, the Albemarle is actually an anglicized version of a French place name. Back in the Middle Ages, you had the kings of England also had claims to much of uh, continental France as Dukes of, Norman, Dukes of Normandy. And you'll notice uh, 
there were wars for over hundreds of years over both the French possessions and the English possessions of the British crown. Well, it was not unusual for English kings to grant um, titles to English noblemen who were um, also held estates in France, and since they technically were sovereigns of uh, at least parts of France. And the uh, Earl of uh, Albemarle is actually a very, very old title that is intimately connected with the royal family. It was generally granted to younger sons or grandsons of the British royal family in the Middle Ages. Um, and, but it had fallen into abeyance in about the 1300s. Uh, George Monk, when he was asked to choose his title, uh, he had a very, very distant claim to this title. And um, he wanted to show that even though he was a new nobleman, he did not want to be seen as nouveau riche. He did want to show his family had an ancient lineage going back to the conquest. Um, so he asked that this title, even though the connection was very distant, be honored. And he was honored as the Duke of Albemarle. So that's how a region in rural North Carolina ended up with the French place name as um, its connection. Uh, once the proprietors had title to this land, they needed a system in place to govern and manage it regarding land ownership, which was the basis of the system. This became clear when settlers started moving down from Virginia and claiming land without um, having a clear legal title. They began setting up uh, homesteads and small farms without uh, necessarily having a written deed to the property. Um, and this also had an effect because uh, they were squatters in the legal sense. The lowest proprietors had expected to make money from um, selling land and also from paying something called quit rents. We, we would uh, think of it as a modern land tax, but basically it meant that after you bought your land from the lower proprietor, they wanted to recreate the feudal system in a sense, so they were to, um, these were like feudal dues that a peasant would pay to a lord. Well, needless to say, the local settlers didn't have that much cash, and they weren't particularly fond of the idea. Um, and these quit rents became a major thorn in the side of both the colonists and the lowest proprietors, and were a major issue of debate. And quite often, the lowest proprietors never really made any much money off the quit rent system. And the uh, settlers, being 3,000 miles away, you can't, uh, number one, didn't have the cash since it was a farm economy. And number two, they figured uh, by clearing the land and settling it and doing business and trade, they had done enough. Anyway, to create an organized form of government for the new colonies, the proprietors turned to John Locke. Some of you may be familiar with him. Locke was a well-known physician, philosopher, and political theorist, who at the time was serving as private physician to the Earl of Shaftesbury, who eventually became one of the Lord Proprietors. Locke was one of the leading English philosophers of the 17th century. He published several works on political theory and was a strong proponent of rational logic in government. He also went on to serve as secretary to the Board of Trade and Plantations, acting as their agent gathering information about the colony. The board was the governmental instrument set up by the uh, British government to oversee um, the proprietorship, even though it was a semi-private um, organization, they still wanted to have some oversight since there was supposed to be a lot of trade with the uh, new colonies. He, what he drew up was commissioned to draw up became the Fundamental Constitutions of Carolina. Some of you that were here a few years ago may remember when it came through this area, the Museum of Albemarle had it on display there, and that was a pretty big deal. Um, and the document itself is quite interesting. It's a combination of a what we would call a modern corporate charter and a feudal agreement between Lord and Vassal. The basic structure for the grant was from King Charles II it was based off the Palatinate of Durham from the Middle Ages. The Palatinate of Durham was the granting of a semi-autonomous status to the area around Durham, England, to the bishops of Durham by the King of England. This is back in the Middle Ages when the uh, Catholic Church owned massive properties and estates all throughout England, and the bishops of Durham in particular were some of the most wealthy and powerful landowners. They acted as feudal lords, maintained their own um, armed retainers and knights and things like that. Um, and the King of England granted this to them because Northern England was known for having uprisings quite often. 
and rebellions, and also was subject to invasion from Scotland quite often um, as well. So having a wealthy, powerful noble who was uh, able to maintain a small private army and um, administer the area on the spot was in, as long as he was a loyal supporter of the king, uh, this was seen as a very positive, net positive for the British crown. With the Palatinate of Durham as an example, John Locke went about drawing up the fundamental constitutions. The constitutions divided the granted lands into a variety of counties, signories, and manors. The various heirs were to be granted to new settlers. The basic idea was that people from England or Europe who had money would buy or be granted a large amount of land and pay to bring over workers to work it for them. The landowners would hold various titles of nobility and the workers would be bonded to them in something resembling serfdom. They literally wanted to recreate the Middle Ages. Uh, at this time in Europe, in the 1600s, you had a change from the, uh, the ends of ending of feudalism and the beginning of what we'd call a modern nation states. You had the very early proto beginnings of what we would call capitalism and a cash economy. But there were many people who were, particularly people in power, who looked back to the good old days and the Lord was literally a Lord upon his own lands and did not want that to change. So they, the result was the idea that they wanted to recreate um, the system here in the New World. King Charles allowed the granting of titles of nobility for these new landowners, but they were not allowed to use the English titles like Duke, Baron, and Earl because he didn't want to denigrate his power to grant a title to someone. So a variety of titles were borrowed from around Europe. The highest, of course, was the Lord Proprietors as overlords of the new colonies, with the King of England as their overall sovereign. Then there was the title Landgraf, which is a title from Germany that was about the equivalent of what we call a baron or count. There were caciques, which is a title used in the Spanish colonies that was roughly the equivalent of being a knight or a baronet in England. And then there were signories that were owned by lords of the manor and were the equivalent of, uh, of a, what we call a large plantation or a large English landed estate with a lord of the manor. Each level of nobility would own a progressively larger grant of land from a land grave with tens of thousands of acres to a lord of the manor with a few thousand acres. These various new nobles would have po feudal powers over the workers that work for them. The system also recognized the ownership of enslaved persons of African descent as workers on these estates and properties. Needless to say, this system was riddled with social injustice and inequalities, the worst of which was the ownership of enslaved persons. There was to be a complex court system that ranged from the manor local level up to the colony levels. In between the title nobility and the workers or serfs was to be a middle class of moderate sized landowners, equivalent to what they call the English yeoman. These were independent small farmers who held from around 50 to several hundred acres of farmland. They were to fill many of the low lower level civil offices like constable or jurymen. As well, there was a sort of colonial legislature similar in nature to the English parliamentary system with different levels of nobles and landowners represented in it. The Lord's proprietors were to take turns rotating power with the eldest of them serving as the Lord Palatine. The office was similar in nature to the oligarchic system used in Venice with the Doge of Venice as the head of state with the support of a noble patrician. It is strange to think that this system of government, if this system had worked, early America could have developed into a semi-feudal agrarian society with lords and serfs. While this system did develop on paper, in reality it never really happened, or never really took off. Several reasons for this existed. Much of the reason was the lowest proprietors were not a very organized group. Although they were high-ranking nobles, they generally lacked the political clout and financial backing to settle most of the East Coast. For colonies to be successful, generally a colony needs the backing of a nation state and its military infrastructure and industrial base. The settlers who came over here were not overly fond of the idea of becoming serfs. Many of them were leaving England because of the lack of religious and social freedom there. They had spent their lives in England being subservient to the upper classes. And once they had made it to the New World and had their own homesteads and farms far from any governmental control, they were loath to be treated as servants again. Social good conditions in England had also changed a great deal from the medieval type of society that the lowest proprietors were trying to recreate. 
Serfdom had largely faded from, the, by, from England by the Renaissance period. There were still lords and workers, but the workers were not serfs, but agricultural laborers who rented their land from, for a set financial amount. A capitalist cash-based society had largely replaced the feudal system. The distance from England and poor communications meant that the governance of the Palatinate was ad hoc at best, with various factions vying for power. The Avermore region tended to be very independent-minded in how it should be governed. Governors were appointed, but were not always accepted by the populace. Various governors came and went with varying degrees of success. Three of these governors are buried here in Edenton at St. Paul's Episcopal Church and are some of the best known. As Dr. Speller just mentioned earlier, some of them were relocated from other outlying plantations and farms. Um, and those of you that may have gone to St. Paul's, you'll know the Governor's Row we sometimes talk about. We have several you know, buried in one section. They are Henderson Walker, Thomas Pollock, and Charles Eden, who of course our town is named for. The careers of these three men give a window onto how the proprietorial system functioned. Henderson Walker came to the colony in 1682. He had likely been educated as a lawyer in England, as he quickly rose to occupy a number of legal offices. These ranged from clerk of court to attorney general for the entire colony. Political offices included a member of the colonial council, customs collector, and secretary of the colonial assembly. He went on to serve as acting governor from 1609 to 1703, and he built up a large practice as a lawyer and invested heavily in buying large tracts of land in both Chowan and Perquimans counties. Uh, Thomas Pollock was also another early settler who came to hold the governorship during the proprietary period. He came to the colony in 1683 to serve as business agent for two of the lowest proprietors representing their interest here. He worked as a lawyer and managed to be apparently quite a good one to acquire 40,000 acres of land, making him one of the biggest landowners in the area. Politically, he held numerous positions in government, including president of the council. After the death of Governor Edward Hyde, he stepped in to fill the governorship for two years, 1712-14, until Governor Charles Eden was appointed and arrived. Politically, he was known as a strong law and order governor and was very protective of the interests of the lowest proprietors. Perhaps most interesting and appropriate enough for those of us in Edenton is Charles Eden, the originator of our town's name, came to the colony and took over as governor in 1714. During his time as governor, he was active in the establishment of the Church of England in the colony and worked to settle the long-running boundary dispute with Virginia. He established a plantation on the Bertie side of the river called Eden House that was supposed to have been quite grand and where he lived in considerable style. He, of course, is known for his possible connection to, and I say possible, uh, to Blackbeard, also known as Edward Teach. It's thought by some that uh, Eden may have turned a blind eye to Teach's pirating and return for some form of financial remuneration. A positive link between the two has obviously never been positive, conclusively proven, but to the last night, the governor's secretary was supposed to have uh, had some stolen goods found in one of his storage barns and was implicated in um, the piracy of Teach, although formal charges were never proven in council. Social privilege and connections likely protected those involved in the scandal, especially with the passing of Blackbeard. Also, for Governor Charles Eden, of some note, he is most likely the last person to be granted the title of Landgrave of the Colony, making him one of the last people to receive a title under the Carolina Peerage. A certain sense of freedom seems to have developed in Albemarle. Settlers tended to view the fundamental constitutions of Carolina as a sort of contractual agreement between themselves and the lowest proprietors. They felt that since the constitutions gave them governmental and legal representation, they had a say in government. This is similar in nature to the English feeling about Magna Carta. As time went on, it became clear the proprietorial system was inefficient. The English crown gradually stepped in and took over the rule of the floundering colonies by the early 1700s by gradually buying out the interests of the various descendants to grandsons and granddaughters of the early proprietors. You might think of it as a large-scale corporate buyout, as the whole system was not unlike a very large land development corporation. By 1729, the last of the inheritors to agree to a settlement was George Carter at the Earl of Granville. He chose to retain his rights as Lord Proprietor, and it was determined that the area he would get was generally known as the Albemarle. In very general terms, this was the area from around about where we are up to, say, the Virginia line. Although I know there's some local dispute over where that area might exactly consist. 
he retained the right to sell land, but the actual governance of the call of his lands fell in with the English crown system. The claims of the Carteret family existed until the time of the American Revolution, at least on paper. With the coming of independence from England, the claims fell into abeyance and were absorbed into the new state government of North Carolina. So what does all this mean for North Carolina? While the proprietarial system and the reestablishment of feudalism failed to take hold in North Carolina, it did contribute in some ways to the formation of the state. The proprietors did at least contribute to the early settlement of the Albemarle region financially and the formation of what was to become our state as a political entity. However, there were quite a few drawbacks. For the Native American population, the loss of land and terrible treatment was terribly egregious. For enslaved persons of African descent who were forced to work the extensive plantations, the terrible results of slavery would be felt for generations. It could be argued that the fundamental constitutions of Carolina acted as a precursor to the concept of, written, of a written contract existing between a people and their government. While the fundamental constitutions contained great inequities like serfdom, aristocracy, and slavery, it did offer at least the common people some voice in their government with clearly delineated responsibilities for both groups. As well, it was written law as agreed to by all parties rather than rule of whim by a tyrant. Also, the establishment of multiple courts for the colony set up by the fundamental constitutions created the legal precedent for judicial checks of set of checks and balances to the system, even if that system was dominated by the aristocracy. And in conclusion, most importantly, uh, what it led to, I believe, on, on a personal level, was that for the state of North Carolina, um, it set the precedent that there does exist between um, the people in power and the people who elect them to be um, an under clear understanding of rights and responsibilities of both groups, and that uh, those responsibilities ought to be taken seriously and to be honored. Well, uh, I know this is a very dense topic, and I'm kind of grabbing about 200 years of history in a, maybe 20 minutes, so please apologize. I do apologize if it's a bit dense, but um, I hope you guys have enjoyed it and learned something, and I'd like to open the floor to any questions if anyone has any. Yes, sir. When the split between North and South Carolina happened there? Uh, that would have been, the official split was, I believe, the very early 1700s. Mm -hmm. um, and technically, believe it or not, for a while we were so, semi-governed. Charleston actually acted as one of the power centers for what happened here. Mm -hmm. um, this area was, because of the geography and the Outer Banks kind of blocking us in and lack of poor access, um, we were kind of one of the later sections to develop. But believe it or not, the proprietary system and the whole Carolina period were really strong in North and South Carolina. So if you if any of you are into South Carolina history, you'll find um, a lot of this, the same stuff I talked about applies to there as well. Anyone else? What area did the Butte, B-U-T-E, couple? Uh, the um, designation Butte, B-U-T-E. Uh, I've, got, I've got a uh, grant from the Lord's Proprietor uh, on the back of it, they have the word Butte. I think that was what county, and it's no longer in existence. What was that? It was a county. In England, the Earl of Butte is a uh, was a British title that I think has fell into abeyance, but um, created for the tutor of I believe who was become George the Third um, before he became king. He, was, he made his tutor and advisor an Earl, but I think Butte is a place in England. I admit I'm not familiar with that, but I think Dr. Spell is right. Um, some of the early, they had to name this area something, and um, like Albemarle counties and stuff like that, uh, some of the early names got sort of, con some fell into abeyance, some got continued on. I admit Butte is, that's something that's new to me, I'm not familiar with. It's it, combined. It, Francis Colvin used the uh, cupola uh, yes, as a lookout for incoming vessels to rush down and collect the tax on the um, goods being brought in. Well, that was a surprise to me. He was the lowest proprietor's agent, and um, that cupola would have made you know quite a good watchtower. Um, and anyone else? Yeah, but Charles, can you kind of quickly contrast North Carolina and Virginia? Well, Virginia was obviously settled um, earlier than us. 
Um, Virginia, technically, the uh, Fairfax family held, um, would have been proprietors and held most of the Northern Neck. Um, Virginia was settled sort of outside of this because they were, became, uh, they were the wealthy established air colony. We were considered sort of the backwoods and um, though the system there never really developed as far as the land, like land grave and things like that, it was really more of a North Carolina, South Carolina thing, but also the lowest proprietors what they were granted is a very unusual, strange in that you'll notice I mentioned Earl Granville had to be granted a set of lands. Um, the lowest proprietors as a group were actually granted almost a, like a stake in what we would call a corporation or a set of stock. So up and down the East Coast, technically different colonies had different um, proprietors and different things like that. Um, what developed in Virginia was very much the plantation system. Um, they were much more prosperous. The government was much more highly centralized compared to here. Um, and then the plantation system gradually developed, was basically brought down into here. Um, but the feudal system never, or the attempts at the feudal system never really took off in Virginia, largely due to the fact that Virginia actually started making money pretty quickly with the growth of tobacco and the big plantations, it generated a lot of revenue. Um, so you had a mixture of land claims and money had a lot to do with it. Now could I make a point here? Um, Lord, Lord Berkeley would have been equivalent to what we're discussing now as a proprietor in Virginia. He controlled Virginia and here. This is considered the southern part of Virginia. And uh, I'll say more about that as an introduction to the free people of color. That's why we got that in there because um, and the Bunch family is very important in that because of the fact that many of the people who didn't quite work as well uh, in Virginia were encouraged to move down here and many of them were considered free people of color. They were very wealthy too. And you make a good point about uh, Berkeley, as Baron Berkeley, technically, um, he was one of the proprietors and had a claim to that area. There was later Governor Berkeley of that same family. And of course there's was it, Berkeley Springs and different things like that. Um, this system was, I, I know it sounds a bit confusing, but even when they set it up, was at best convoluted and at best ad hoc. Imagine trying to uh, create a colony, re recreating the feudal system 3,000 miles away when your best communication is a wooden sailing ship that might take three to six months to get there. <laughs> so um, if, you think, if you think it's bad now with uh, slow internet or email now, imagine <laughs> trying to go there. Um, in fact, I think one of the most interesting things, you bring up a good point, is, uh, well, next door, the, uh, you know, the Cupola House, uh, Francis Corbin. Uh, the Earl of Granville actually, you know, he was his business agent for Corp, um, for the Earl of Granville in charge of, you know, buying and selling and managing properties here. Uh, the Earl of Granville actually wrote out a very concise series of, you know, business standard operating procedures and business protocols, but because it took so long for him, any of the information to get here, at the time the decisions were already been made long before his decisions would have ever arrived. <laughs> Another question. Virginia had Burgesses, but I've never heard that term used in North Carolina. Not really. North Carolina, under the system that they wanted to set up, um, we had a colonial council and eventually a colonial assembly, which of course became our you know, state legislature eventually. Um, they wanted to set up, believe it or not, the equivalent of the English Parliament with houses of lords, mm -hmm. and um, you would actually have different it was very fascinating if you ever read more into the topic. Uh, the Locke actually designed a system whereby um, the, how much land you owned and whether you were the direct inheritor of a nobleman or the first son or second son, you could sit in this uh, part of the legislature or if you were um, you know, a cacique, which is with the equivalent of what they would call a knight or baronet. Um, you could sit in this part of the um, parliamentary system. It was basically like the lords and the commons in England, except um, even more complicated than theirs. 
Um, like I said, a lot of this was developed on theory and paper, um, but it never really made it into effective law um, here on the ground in the mm -hmm. colony. Mm -hmm. They had some people here that was, they call them mutinous. You remember we had a discussion of mm -hmm. the mutinous people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They blocked it. They blocked what they wanted to do. That's why we get the years. So that's why we ended up with what we had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've got an awful lot of important gravestones, flat gravestones in the churchyard, St. Paul's. Yes, sir. Uh, and I know that uh, a lot of rubbings have been done of what the original mm -hmm. inscriptions were. Yes, sir. Has there ever been a move to sort of deepen those inscriptions so that they could be legible? Uh, um, not to my knowledge from the... I was just talking about this with another historian. From what I understand about gravestones, because a lot of the early stone is so soft, um, they would literally have to go back and re-carve or redo it. And technically, as, under general rules of historic preservation, mm -hmm. when you start digging into historic, like a historic grave or a historic <laughs> statue, it's usually not the thing they want to do. What is interesting, though, is um, they have developed some new chemical compositions that can actually be applied to the graves, and they will... Um, actually eat away like the dirt and the moss and stuff, the lynchings, whatever you call it, that's grown into them, and so that you don't have to uh, do too much. Um, but that would be, of course, that's the church's property, so that's a little out of my There was area. someone from the state who did a demonstration with mm -hmm. that. There were several of us mm -hmm. who had been there, mm -hmm. Sally Francis. That was pre-COVID, then I think things just sort of right. came to a halt. But we were learning how to to clean and care mm -hmm. for some of those older stones. And they used to do, I remember growing up, grave rubbings were a big deal. Even now, they don't recommend that as a good practice because it can put wear and tear on the mm -hmm. graves themselves. If you think, you know, stone has been sitting up for 200 years in our moist climate, you don't want to be rubbing on it too hard, I wouldn't think. Mm -hmm. But I do think it is fascinating that the uh, Governor Eden's grave uh, still has the uh, very ornate and still very clear, clearly legible coat of arms with the, I think it's a boar or something on the, as part of his family symbol. Yeah. Um, I always like to point that on, on the tours I did. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right, well, thank you for your time and appreciation. Um, <laughs> great talking to you, and uh, like I said, I work for Historic Eden State Historic Site, and uh, we're just down the road at 108 North Broad Street. Please feel free to come by. We have just remodeled our visitor center. And we encourage people to come by and see it. We've taken it back to its roughly uh, uh, Victorian style. And, of course, we're always looking for volunteers and community members for our various activities and events. Uh, thank you for honoring me and letting me do it. It's an honor to be here. Great. Thank you, Charles. Thank, thank you. you. Do I need to use this? Did you pay about? Oh, yes, sir. Do I need this? Yes. 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 Uh, as a result of some of the things he's talking about from Virginia uh, as a family that is very wealthy uh, and the uh, English in that at that time, at that point in time, around 1712 or somewhere in that area, uh, were more or less trying to keep some of the original uh, English uh, 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 things in place. Uh, so what I thought I would do is do two things with this. I had asked um, Dr. Turn Sutton uh, to come and speak about the Bunch family. Uh, they started out here, but they, then they, they bought land and developed over in, more in Bertie as builders and uh, uh, farmers. They were also eventually plantation owners as well. Uh, but we also wanted, we thought it would be more important to talk about them as builders, because they were. They were just as important as, as some of the others, but they didn't get that attention because at the time they were, they were still considered to be Malata and the uh, 
and it, as you will see, uh, sometimes it was un we were unsure whether they actually uh, were more of the builders of the house than some of the people that got credit for it because they were very quirky and unique in some of the styles they used, and it showed up. But uh, when Catherine Bysher and all of them did their books on the builders, they didn't include them in the black uh, builders, and they referred to them as starting out as mulatto builders and later becoming white, which they did. Um, and we may have time to discuss the implications for that. Uh, and I was telling uh, Dr. Sutton night before last, um, we considered them, at least I considered them, the salamanders uh, in this transition that happened both here in North Carolina and South Carolina. But I don't want to take up his time, but I did want to, and he asked me to do this, um, tell you about um, their development and how they went from being mulatto to white. Um, what happened was that um, Shawan County covered what is now 14 counties. And so when they came in, they came in here, and then they bought land in Bertie County, and they were mulatto in Bertie County, and they were very wealthy and started buying up farms and so forth. And they were actually so wealthy that the white males and so forth in Bertie County uh, encouraged their daughters to marry them because at that time, um, the land stayed with the males, and yet uh, and they did not have that many uh, females in that family, so uh, they knew that, and they knew eventually that some, some of that land would eventually end up into some of the other families, which it did. And as we ended up creating more of the caste system that we're now trying to get rid of, um, they were able to move out of that because of the fact that whoever controlled the census records and so forth could do that. And so what they did, if uh, it was one of the bunch families and that came up as an issue, you can go in and see what they just mobbed through the ladder and put in white. <laughs> okay, then the bunches, the reason why I call them salamanders is because um, they were doing something too. Okay. And uh, we had to decide to go one way with it, and then I told, you mind me calling you Turner? Okay. I, as we were going through this, and we kept looking, we had been doing some research on something else that he's going to talk to you about. I kept looking and saying, hey, wait a minute. The um, genealogists are saying that there are at least three sets of these bunches. And I kept saying, as far as I'm concerned, there were only two sets, the ones that stayed in Virginia and had already been declared white because they had married white females there. And the ones that were over here. But they had said that they, some sets had gone to Tennessee and Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Well, when I went back to check, I just wanted to be sure I was correct. I found something else out which you all are hearing for the first time. We knew that all of the other groups that migrated to Tennessee, South Carolina, which they didn't include, and Arkansas, were from Jeremiah Bunch, the prominent builder, plantation owner over in Bertie County. So I went back and looked, and all of a sudden I realized that Jeremiah Bunch Jr. and his brother Henry had moved up to the Raleigh Durham, what is now the Raleigh Durham area. And that's all the historians had said. But I, got, I put on my detective uh, thinking, which is, I'm going to look and see where you are geographically and then go and look at what's in the courthouse. Lo and behold, and I gave him that, but he asked me to share this with you, um, the um, Jeremiah Bunch Jr. and Henry went into what is now Hillsborough and those areas and bought land from 
the Shapani Indians. On the records there, they are listed, Jeremiah Bunch Jr. and Henry, as Shaponi. <laughs> so I then went and looked to see if that was happening in other places. So wherever there was land that they bought to stay within the politics of it, they took the race. And they were of a color where they could go any way they wanted to, you know, since we had the mulattoes and they were a mixed race of Indians, Africans, and so forth. Uh, uh, it gave them uh, a flexibility that some people wish they had now. <laughs> so the point is, if you have enough money, you can do what you want. <laughs> um, the other thing I do want to mention, and uh, you can show all of this, but I'm just giving the background. Um, in the process of um, doing this, um, I got nervous about it with the 16, anytime you bring up 16, 19, somebody from both sides, I'm talking about both, I'm being Trump today, from both sides, um, the um, critical race theory thing comes up. And so how this got started was with the bunches again. Um, one of the, the original bunch was named, was an indentured servant from um, Scotland. He was part African American and part uh, Scottish. Well, he came as an indentured servant to um, the, the, near the Jamestown area back in about 1619. And uh, he, uh, back then, they were slaves. Uh, some came on the boats as slaves, but when they got off the boat, they were bought as indentured servants, which meant that when uh, they had their seven year or three year, depending on where, who owned them, uh, then they would be free. So, because the racial system, I mean the uh, slavery system had not started there, so that started about 50 years later. So, uh, uh, but he ran away and did not want to uh, carry that through, and he was called and brought back, and he was given permanent lifetimes uh, and, and became what is considered the first slave in uh, child slave in this. Um, so, he was bought. The person that bought him uh, did not have a family. He, he, the, he just had a wife. Well, the wife died before he did. And when he died, he left Punch, John Punch all of his land. That's how he got wealth. Then he married a white lady. And Virginia had just made the ruling that you followed the race of your mother. That's how they got to be for that. Okay. Then there was another family, the same thing happened. And the Virginians of note said, we can't have all of these mixed race folks in here thinking that they're going to be just like us. So they made a deal with the powers that be here in Chawan County. And most of that group came here and bought land and so forth. And so it got to the extent that you all heard this first, at least over here. Now, he's heard this so much, he's sick of it. But my critical race theory is that if you can trace your relatives in these areas back to 1641, you are probably related. Now, nobody wants to hear that from me. You know that much. So that's all I'm going to say because I did want to let you understand that this is why the people here resisted. They had, they had the background to know what it had been like, and they did not want that system that would come in from England um, to cause them to do that. So they held out for about 40 years. So people don't understand it was really, now they were in Bertie, they weren't here. Uh, they were in Bertie. So the reason why I always feel that Bertie County is very important is because they are the ones that are talked about in the um, mutinous, as mutinous people, because they held out to the extent that the powers that be here that wrote up 
the Bill of Rights that we brag about, that North Carolina supplied to the Constitution, started right here, and, and that was how they got it passed. So I, and I didn't intend to take that time, but I thought it was important to let you know that just about everything that you are dealing with that relates to freedom and what we call the melting pot in North, in North America started right down here as a result of some things in Virginia. So you do have to go back to Virginia. So turn, come on and take over and focus on the uh, famous black field. Thank you, Dr. Scullin, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this workshop here. I think we can call it a workshop. Maybe you improve the things for many of you are newcomers, and so on. I'll try to set the stage for these homes in there. And I, Dr. Scullin has already mentioned a little bit about the bunch down there. This will be a review. Excuse, excuse me. Excuse me. Can yeah. You? Back row can't hear. Back row can't hear. Can you hear better now? Yeah. Get the speak in the mic. Speak in the mic. Yeah. 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 So then driving, as he as well said, in Virginia prior to 18, excuse me, 1637, and were to become uh, indentured servants. Some of the family moved into Chowan County in the late 1600s and early 1700s. There are uh, records in the, in the courthouse and deeds from the date back to that time. And then they, sometime in the early 1700s, they moved into Bertie County. And as Dr. Spell said, they became very prominent landowners and they became well known as builders as well during that time. Now, this next slide shows that there was a group of, of the family that remained in Virginia. And out of that line came Mr. Obama, well, but he was the first uh, black man to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. And Lonnie Branch, who is the secretary today, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. So it's a very, very prominent family that they have. You know, we can trace our ancestors of our Jeremiah Branch back to as well. Next up, this fellow. Can I control that, or do you need me to control? I can. You control. Yeah, I can control it. It's not set up. Since you're newcomers, I just thought I'd show everybody a picture for T County. I think most of you will recognize it, but I'll show you. I want to particularly show you the area that I'm going to be focusing on today, where the homes I'll be talking about are really in this this area right through here. The Egypt's over here at the end of Highway 17 and that was hard. Now, Tim, next slide. talking about it positioned on this map. So it shows, shows in this particular case the uh, 
Gilm, the Gilm house, um, the Craig house, and here would be historic hope right here. Now, the houses that I am going to be talking about are about nine or ten, and they're located along what is now Highway 308, uh, the Republican Highway, which runs somewhat parallel to it, and positioned here on this era is where Historic Hope is located. So you'll see, I'm going to first talk about this cluster of houses that are in the southeastern part of the county, or southeastern part close to Windsor, and then we'll move on up in this area. So This is the uh, Turner Carter House. We're pretty sure that Jeremiah Bunch built this. Um, he was the, my third great grandfather, so that's probably where Turner comes from, in there. Um, it has, it's an old house, you can see here, it has uh, two shoulders to the chimneys, which are an example, I guess, an indication that it's an old house. And those of you who have all remember or are familiar with Windsor may know have been to Bojangles, been past Bojangles. Mm -hmm. Well, this is where Bojangles sits today, unfortunately. Oh. Oh. It was destroyed probably about 20 years ago when, when Bojangles was, was built there. So. <laughs> Close to that Bojangles, just a, a little bit. Not too far away from the Turner Carter House is the Thomas Bond House. It was built about 1830, and it, along with several of the other houses that I'll show you, has an above ground basement to it. Now today, you will be if you if you're coming down 308, you will come to this will be the front of the house right here, and this. Porch part has been taken off, man. I didn't really notice it too much until I was looking at it the other day. It was removed at some some point in time. But it's, it's characteristic of a number of the houses that I'll show you with that above ground <laughs> basement. Um, down the road a little ways is the Lewis Bond house. And my ancestors are Bonds that came to Bertie County in about 17. 50, I'm not real sure who this person is. <laughs> um, Lewis was a very common first name in my family, but the time frame doesn't really fit. And they, but the house is an old house. Again, you can see two shoulders to this chimney. And well, it's associated with the Turners. Right. The One of them married in the Turner family. Yeah, it could be through that, that way. The front part of the house is, uh, has an addition that served as a pharmacy and a doctor's office earlier. Um, the house itself has been in the Extall family now since about the mid 1830s and is still preserved today. The next one? Okay. Well, this is a very interesting house for a number of reasons. Unfortunately, it's been destroyed. Um, it was destroyed uh, in the, I don't say the night. 1960s or early 1970s. Um, it had a central chimney and had a spiral staircase in it. And it was built prior to the when Lucinda Bond married Samuel J. Wheel. So it was probably built sometime in the early 1800s as a Bond has. Now, some of the most interesting, why this is a very interesting house is a little bit because of the people that live there. Um, whoops. Oh, so you want to go back? Yes, not yet. Um, Sandy J. Wheeler, when, they got, when Sandy J. Wheeler and Lucinda Vaughn were married, they moved into this house, but he was, he was from Marcus Park, and they would soon move back to Mother's Bar, where he would become a very prominent doctor. He was one of the founders of Chowan University, and he was a writer in a number of newspapers and such. But perhaps most interesting was his brother, John Hill Wheeler. Now, John Hill Wheeler was a diplomat. He served as the uh, um, diplomat from the United States in Nicaragua. He lived in Washington for a while, and maybe best known for his book, The Historical Sketches of North Carolina, which was one of the seminal histories that was written at that particular point in time. 
Now, the reason I say that this is a very interesting one because there's very strong evidence now that Hannibon, and now we can go up here, okay. Hannibon came to the Wheelers, and I guess Ben and I may have hypothesized it's really perhaps through this marriage of Lucinda into the Bond family. But regardless, <laughs> she moved in with um, the Wheelers. Uh, she had access to a very large library there. She could read, she could write, and uh, we believe there's a very strong connection between her and Bertie Fanny and this book that I'm sure many of you are familiar with today. So. Many of us think that she's a Bond because traditionally when um, a, a family when, when, when a, a family married, they would either give uh, servants, um, she was probably given to Lucinda as a servant. Probably given to Lucinda. Yeah. Think, and that's probably, I think that's the way she got to Marcusburg. Mm -hmm. might, that's, that's just, just a hypothesis. The next house is, uh, this house is located about two miles east of Historic Hope on Highway 308, or was. It too has been destroyed. I don't know how long ago Ben. Ben may know a bit. But uh, Moses Gillum was the Adventist minister. Oops. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry that the uh, that house was used to renovate Coke. Okay. So this house. It was taken down in, in all early, of the in the late 60s or early 70s. So. It was originally tall and narrow. It is the birthplace of Locke Craig, who was to become governor of North Carolina, and his mother, Rebecca. And Rebecca's half-sister was Dr. Spello's third great-grandmother, I think. Um, across from that house sat the John Vaughn Locke Craig house. Now, we learned, I guess, at our, our conference we had uh, last month that John Vaughn built this house, but the Craigs really lived in it from, from the about 1850 on until um, Locke Craig uh, and his mother moved. They lived in the house uh, for 15 years, and they moved then to Chapel Hill, where he enrolled in the university. Um, at the time he graduated, he was the youngest graduate of UNC. And he was an excellent orator and was asked to speak at commencement. And he was the commencement speaker there at that time. He moved to Asheville, uh, became a legislator, and was governor and is buried in Asheville. Across from this is historic hope. And there's a lot of controversy on who built the mansion here. It was occupied by the government about 1802 has an above ground basement to it. Um, there is one line of evidence that says that William Say, who was a, who was a uh, uh, carpenter that uh, lived up to the Oxbow, they had been involved in building this. Uh, in our own mind, Jeremiah Bunch lived only about two miles away, so it's almost hard to believe that he wasn't at least involved in some way in the building this particular house. So. So we know this is Jeremiah Bunch Jr.'s house. Um, it is restored today. It uh, was moved uh, probably 30 years ago from the Republican Road, which is set on across the field, and that faces Schoolhouse Road. Uh, it's not open to the public, but it is fully restored and maintained. Next. Just a little ways down the road is the Benjamin Bazemore house, and we, we had looked and looked for a picture of the Benjamin Bazemore house and couldn't find one, but this is a uh, painting by Francis Spade of this house, and I don't know very much about it, but uh, it was again a similar type house and it had, I believe, an above ground basement as well, which seems to be characteristic of a number of homes in that area. Next, Dr. Spella. Just north of there, as you go, actually north and west, is this Rock Spate House, or Sherrick Spate House. Now, um, the Sherricks were builders as well, but they're probably best known uh, for their furniture making. They were good cabinet makers in there. We have several Sherrick pieces at Hope. I think we have at least three Sherrick pieces at Hope. 
And so I put that there because we feel like there's a possibility that he might have been involved in this, although there's not a lot of evidence that he was directly. Francis Spade lived in this house. Is everybody familiar with Francis Spade? No, Francis Spade. Francis Spade was an art, artist of some renown. He was born there. Um, he worked at the Pennsylvania Academy of, of Art, Fine Arts um, for 30 years, 40 years. Uh, he married his, one of his students, Sarah Blakesley. Uh, he was an artist and resident of East Carolina, and his uh, paintings hang in a number of the most prominent museums in the eastern part of the country, if not throughout the nation. We're, we're very fortunate to have about five of his paintings at Hope, as well as several of those of Sarah Blakesley's, and so if you come to Hope, you're certainly welcome to come and, and take a look at those. So he was a strong supporter of historic Hope from the very beginning. Okay, Dr. Stella. This is another interesting house, an interesting family, because it brings up some points. This is the Pew Urquhart House that was built about 1801. And it was built by Whitmore Hill Pew. And in the 1818, he and two of his brothers moved to Louisiana. Now, this was typical of a number of prominent counties, families in Berkeley County, and I suspect throughout the region in which family members would move to other states, Tennessee, Louisiana, Alabama, and others, and became very prominent. And um, they became among the largest landowners in Louisiana during that time. And just before the Civil War, they owned 13 plantations. And their houses were palatial compared to what we see here in eastern North Carolina, at least to me. Next, then. This is one that is actually was just fell, fell down and was destroyed about 1930. It was a wood lawn, you can see like that. And there was one, the next one was has owned by the uh, National Park Service. It was restored. It was a plantation of about 10,000 acres. And at that time, they had almost 500 slaves in that plantation. But again, this, this is just indicative of a number of families in this area that had very significant impact in other states uh, as they moved and became very wealthy and prosperous and politically powerful. And another new thing about the pews when uh, the Civil War was over and they decided to move uh, back to, they stayed down here, they moved uh, back to um, um, Louisiana. They gave to the former slaves here, they divided it out. 14,000 acres. So the slaves that were here ended up with a uh, gift of land uh, when they were freed by uh, the end of the Civil War. Does, does Maidwood still exist? Yes. yes. Yeah. It's National Park Service owns that. And it is available for tours. And if you go on the website and look, I mean, it's, it's amazing on the inside of what it looks like. And they have it restored with periods. Antiques are really high quality. It's, it's in the, um, next year, I think it's going to be the last house. I don't know very much about this house. It was uh, close to Orlando at one time, for those of you that may be familiar with uh, Bertie County. It was moved about 10 miles and it's fully restored. It's just uh, west of the Hotsky Mine, and you can see it from the road there, but I know very little about it. And my last slide, then, I think is. That's yeah. it. A little propaganda. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to let me say, if you haven't been to Historic Hope, you need to come. I have a few brochures that we'd be glad to pass around. Um, in addition to the mansion, which is fully restored, we have the King Baysmore House, which is 1860, 1768, it's fully restored. In our Heritage Center, we have uh, several museums. Our Multicultural Room Museum has many artifacts that represent the multicultural diversity in the region and how this impacts everything we've done. As I indicated, we have a very nice art collection. Uh, Francis Spates among the better ones, but we have a, a collection of Louis Orr's paintings or etchings of Eastern North Carolina, a full set of those that are on display there, and 
quite nice, as well as a number of local artists have displayed. And uh, we have a number of programs there throughout the year that I think many of you would find interesting. So I have a few brochures and also membership forms. We're always delighted to have new members, so I'll pass that along as well. And I'll answer any questions any of you may have, or Dr. Spell might be able to help me if I don't know. Yes, sir. Is, is Elmwood your ancestral home? Uh, are you kin to Stark, Sutton? I do not know. Um, there were several Suttons in Bertie County, and um, my Sutton line is more uh, in the wooded area as opposed to along the Chilean River, but I'm, I have a feeling if we went back far enough, I would find some connection. So. And then some of those Suttons went down to Mississippi, too. That mm -hmm. sort of created some confusion. They did marry into the bonds. Uh, one of them was a doctor, and he, he came back and married somebody from Bertie. But he, 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 he was originally from Bertie, but he, he moved to the um, Mississippi. Well, and Hope is a wonderful place to visit. Thank you. Yes, yes. It, is. it is. Thank we were, you. We're open for tours. Friday, April the 1st. We've been closed all winter except for groups of four or more, but we will be open on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday until Memorial Day, and then during the summer we'll be open every day except for Sunday in that regard. So please come and visit us. Uh, we have our docents uh, do a great job. It's about a two-hour tour from uh, if you want to see everything and hear everything, it's, it takes about two hours. Because again, we're, we have a lot to show in our Heritage Center, and then we have the two houses and all of which a lot of information about everybody. So. I have a quick question. Um, why above ground basements? Probably because below ground is flooded. Okay. <laughs> that was my guess. But I... my guess. Uh -huh. And so in Virginia, we call it English basements. Why don't you call them back here? It may have. It may have. I'm not sure. But, but they're above ground basements today. Basements above ground basements. I guess because we're in North Carolina. Okay. <laughs> yeah, some are partially sunk in a little for maybe a foot or two, but mostly it's a, mostly above ground. So. I know there are a few homes in, Ber in Windsor that have basements that almost always flood. Yeah. Uh, well, the Windsor floods are not if you have a big heavy rain, they almost always will get water in them, so. That makes sense. Well, thank you. You have to have sure. a pump. Yeah. You have to have a pump. They do. <laughs> exactly. So they, have, they have a necessity. Yes, yes. If you, have, you need a pump, if you've got a below ground basement, in this part of the state. So. That was my job. Okay. Well, thank you sure. very thank much. You. Well, and again, as a timekeeper, I think we have a break now, and we'll make it a little shorter break so we can come back and learn about the development of religion in this area from John Moorhead. Oh, boy. So every, yes, oh, boy. True to form, uh, we're running a little behind, and so if you have to leave, please do, but we have a very special visitor with us, and... If you would please join us, this is Penelope Barker, <laughs> and we are delighted to have her with us today. And rather than, um, as I understand it, Penelope is going to tell us more about some of her friends that we don't hear as much about. And thank you. Go ahead. So, and we'll see you tomorrow. I hope. Good. Good. So Penelope, thank you so much for traveling through time and being with us. Teacher, teacher, can we have a party break? Um, yes, does that, please, and, and grab a little snack or whatever. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I just wonder how she can go to the beach. I think you've got a lot of here. And that was great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that you've been learning all about the early settlement of North Carolina, the culture, the religion. So I know you, Judge Boyle also spoke to you about the pre-revolutionary era to include 
the Committee of Correspondence and the important people during that time. I am also going to talk about that time period, but as Penelope Barker, I'm going to talk about it from a woman's point of view. If you have lived in Edenton for even two weeks, or your entire life, you have heard of the Edenton Tea Party. Briefly, what it was was a group of women signed a letter, attached a document, a statement, basically um, saying that they would not buy tea or, or trade material, anything from England, and that they would join me in the fight for independence, and that was sent to England. I am going to be going into more detail about that. Um, but before I tell that story about the other 50 women, I'd like to tell you mine. I was born right here in Chuan County in 1728. My father was a physician and my mother was from the affluent Blunt family. Interestingly, both my parents felt I and my sisters, Elizabeth and Sarah, should receive a little bit, if you will, more formal training. Thankfully, they had that concept because it certainly helped me through my life, particularly in my adulthood, of which you will soon hear about. My life was fairly normal until my mid-teens when my father and my sister Elizabeth died within the year. Soon I was taking care of my niece and nephews, Isabella, John, and Robert. And at the age of 17, I married my widowed brother-in-law, John Hudson. Sadly, he passed in two years, but by that time, he and I both had two sons, Samuel and Thomas. Here I was at 19, a widow, five children, and a fairly substantial household to take care of. A few years later, I married James Craven, a local planner and a political leader here in the area. We worked together for four years until he too passed. We did not have any children, so as such, I became sole heir of our holding, our property, our estate, which also included what I brought forth from my previous marriage. This made me one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest woman in North Carolina at that time. A few years later, at the age of 28, I married Thomas Barker. Thomas had originally come down from Massachusetts to read law in Bertie County. He was a lawyer. He traveled Bertie County and Chawan County. And he, when I married him, he was a widower with one daughter, Betsy. Thomas and I had three children, little Penelope, Thomas, and Nathaniel. But sadly, my babies did not lead to see their first birthday. 1761 saw Thomas on his way to England. He was a colonial agent, you know. Basically, his job was to help represent North Carolina to the king and parliament as much as he could. Sadly, by 1763, all of my children but Betsy had passed. Betsy married, and she moved to Virginia with her new husband. So as you can imagine, my life was far different than my friend's for I was making day-to-day -day decisions regarding the household, our property, our holdings. That was my life up into the mid-1760s. So let me tell you about those fabulous 50 other women. The early 1770s saw an increase in the independence movement away from England. That was basically because England was broke. They had just finished their seven-year war. They had no money. The country was really broke. As such, they thought the easiest way to increase their coffers was to tax the colonists. Taxes any way they could. They needed that money. You might have heard of the 1765 Stamp Act. That is where anything printed was taxed. Oh, it's true. It was revoked three years later after the colonists protested, fought the tax, and everything. But the damage was already done. We knew Britain would tax us any way they could. Another one that comes to mind was the 1773 Tea Act. That is where Britain required 
I say required, not suggested, not highly recommended, but required that we purchase our tea from the East India Company. Now, the East, East India Company was one of the largest companies in Britain, and they too were going broke. So what better way to help the company is to make the colonists purchase tea from them. Some of us personally believe that members of parliament may have held a financial holding in that company. Meetings were held, protests up and down the coast. It was all, not only the men who were upset, but the women. For remember, who purchased the items for households and families? It was the women. So the women knew what was going on in the colonies. One of the most famous protests, I've been told, happened on Dece in December of 1773. In the dead of night, men dressed as Native Americans snuck down to the Boston Harbor and threw tea into the water. I understand there was about a hundred of those men. That protest made the history books. But as I said, it was not only the women, or not only the men, but the women. I heard of a protest in Boston. Hmm, kind of a, why Boston? And this is where the socialites of Boston were having a grand ball for a lord who was visiting from England. Who knows who the lord was? And as you would imagine that the women of that time would show up to a ball in their silk and brocade and would be wearing all their fabulous jewels. That night at the ball, the women showed up in homespun cotton linen gowns and not a gem was to be seen that night. They were protesting. We women in Edenton knew, too knew what was going on. We knew the North Carolina Provincial Congress had voted to rescind trade with England. We knew the Continental Congress would vote and did vote to suspend trade with Britain. We knew we had to do something. But we also realized that whatever action we took could have grave consequences, not only to ourselves, our families, but others in the community. So on October 25th, 1774, a letter signed by 51 women, signed with their names, not hidden in dark of night, along with the statement, was sent over to two newspapers in London the London Morning Chronicle and the London Advertiser. Yes, they were printed. Because we have proof, a couple of things. One is one of our citizens here in Edenton. James Iredell had a brother, Arthur, who lived in London. Now, he wrote back to James, stated a few words, and I am truly paraphrasing what he said, because I think this is what he had in mind. What? is going on in Edenton. Have the women taken over? Well, the men in Britain did not take us seriously. They laughed at us. They joked. They really cute us. This caricature showed up in one of the London <laughs> newspapers. It was done by a cartoonist and a gentleman, and I'll use that term very loosely, by the name <laughs> of Philip Dawes. He did not portray us in a too favorable light. I have a funny feeling I might be the one with the gavel. I'm not quite sure. Uh, and then, of course, we never did have dog sign the proclamation. <laughs> so we were not taken at all seriously. But again, our stand was that we were not to purchase items made or produced from England and that we were showing support for independence from the country. Perhaps, looking back, it was a good thing that they didn't take us seriously, for what we did could be considered an act of treason. Now, I told you that Thomas, my husband, <coughs> went to England, 1761. He was there for 17 years. While we were doing this, Thomas was still in England. Many of the men folk related to us were still doing business with England, so again, their lives were in danger if England had taken us seriously. Well, I have to admit, that was the end of our political activities 
our life returned to normal. Thomas came back in 1778 and died in 1789. That was the Edenton Tea Party. I've become known because my house still stands down at the water. But I would like to take a few moments and tell you about these other 50 brave women. We were not all from Edenton, Chawan County. Some came as far away as what is now known as Gates County, Bertie County, and Perquidmans County. Some were married, some single, some widowed. Our youngest signers were 17 years of age. Our oldest was a grandmother several times over. Some of us were wives of lawyers, planters, merchants, innkeepers, tavern owners. Many of the widows had taken up their businesses when their husbands had passed. We had mothers, we had daughters. We had two sisters that their father, during most of his adulthood, was under the care, if you will, of St. Paul's Parish. They provided him food and a place to stay. We had a mother of an English baronet. We had a daughter of a governor. We were all different, but we were the same for what we wanted. One of the signers was a month away from getting married. Now, don't you think she had other things on her mind than <laughs> independence? But she was there signing. Some of the women never saw the creation of these United States of America. One of the signers lived to, and died in 1843. Can you imagine what her life, what she saw, what she learned throughout all of those years? Those women were brave. They signed their names. I do wonder what would happen today. Would we be that brave? Would you be that brave? Years have come. The world has changed since that time. As you know, the War of Independence went from 1775 to 1783. July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was approved, and one of our citizens, Joseph Hughes, signed that document. And then Mr. Hughes went into Washington, D.C., and held the position of what we now call the Secretary of the Navy. He helped create the United States Navy. 1787, in September, the U.S. Constitution was signed. Again, another Edenton citizen, Dr. Hugh Williamson, attended the Continental Congress and was known to be a great debater. He was there for the Constitution. All of these people that came from Edenton. One thing I think we shall never, we should never forget is freedom is never free. And that has not changed throughout the years. And I'd like you to promise me this, that when you walk the streets of Edenton, you think about the brave men and women who fought, who sacrificed, who survived to make this the United States of America. Thank you. What a wonderful way to end our day. Thank you. And now, um, in more recent years, mm -hmm. she is known as Annette Wright. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Much. I'm so for the Penelope. Yeah. Well, this weekend, don't tell anybody, but I was Professor McConaughey.